Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, it's a really busy room, and there are people standing, which is uh, really thrilling to see. So thank you to everyone for coming. My name is Adam Smith. I'm deputy community editor at The Economist newspaper. Uh, you can hear from my voice I'm British, but I now live in New York. And um, just wanted to welcome you all to ONA and welcome to, you to our session uh, on trust. We're each going to uh, speak for, the, we have a three part structure to the session this morning. The first part is the three of us are going to speak uh, for no more than five minutes each, uh, outlining a little bit more about the way that our very different media organizations approach this issue of trust. Uh, then the three of us will get together and have a fireside chat with no fire just some lovely taupe panels behind us. And then uh, for, the third, for, the, for the third act, uh, we want to hear from you folks and we want to have a bit more of a discussion. So that's the three-part structure. Uh, please tweet along with the hashtag ONA17Trust. Uh, you know, we want to we hear from you. We want to see what people are talking about. And also, we do have a document with extra resources uh, that is going to be available afterwards. We'll tweet about it, and it's also going to be in the shared resources space. And it is a, um, it's basically a list of questions that we thought might be interesting for everyone here to take back to their newsrooms to ask themselves and their colleagues about how they approach trust. And then there's some also some links and other resources in there as well. Um, so uh, I think that's all the housekeeping. I will begin with uh, my presentation. If I and I just said presentation because I'm in America and I'm, I normally say presentation. Can, can I have the next slide, please? So, um, uh, and the next one, actually. So I uh, work for The Economist, which in um, 1843, when we were founded, looks like this. Um, this is the first uh, page of The Economist. We were created in Britain as a classically liberal, in the British school of thought sense of the word, newspaper, weekly, on current affairs. And um, we have a few quirks, which uh, I think have been very interesting throughout our history, but are specifically interesting now in, in 2017, especially in this discussion that we're all having now about trust, which we probably wouldn't have been having so, uh, so loudly in the media a few years ago. Um, and those quirks include the fact that we are a, a views paper. All of our pieces uh, have elements of news and analysis in them. We have uh, very strong opinions on the world. We apply our uh, liberal values to what's going on in the world, and we do that transparently. Uh, we are global, but we're also British. Uh, we want to be finishable. Um, <laughs> We want to be finishable, so you know we're a weekly newspaper, but um, you know we, we only produce a certain amount. We are a relatively low volume publisher in terms of um, articles. We want so we want to be finishable, um, which kind of is interesting in the in the era of infinite scroll. We are not super transparent about the way that we work, and partly and an example of that is the way that we don't have bylines on our articles. Uh, our writers in the paper are anonymous, uh, and so all of our pieces go through a long editorial process so that we uh, can refine the single voice that is the voice of The Economist. Um, and our corporate structure ensures editorial independence. So I just wanted to flag those uh, quirks you know, at the top of this discussion about trust. Um, and then go into how we have, um, if I can have the next slide, please, as well. It's actually um, for, it's a few, uh, and if you keep pressing it four times, you'll see a few, um, you see sort of how our covers have evolved. I mean, these are all relatively recent covers, only in the past year or two, I think. And there's one more um, that was shared quite heavily on social. If you can go to the next one, please. Um, so here we all are now, uh, you know, on all of these platforms and all of these different places. I want to tell a little, say a little bit about how we have um, built trust in print over 170 four years, uh, and again, these are sort of interesting quirks, I think. Um, so um, much of our reporting is our own voice. That's that single ev economist voice that I talked about. So we, do, we are a group of shoe leather reporters. We are out and about all the time. Uh, we have beat reporters. They're, we're, they're posted around the world. They, 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 you know, in terms of America in the election last year, they were in factories in Pennsylvania uh, speaking to people, etc. But you would not necessarily know that. Or if you did, the only signal that you might get at the top of an article would be the dateline, you know, Scranton or something like that. And so it's not, it's, it's not that transparent. Um, 
And, um, but we also do have access to power, and I think that that is sometimes implied in, the way, in what we're writing and sometimes not. Uh, our writing is very, very clear. We state our position, uh, we state our values, and we say, you know, this is what should be done. Uh, we discussed on social media about the extent to which we flag up when we're publishing an editorial, the extent to which we say this is definitely an editorial, even though everything that we do sort of has our analysis incorporated into it. Um, our single voice aims to be, to sound, knowledgeable and authoritative, which brings um, issues of trust uh, into the fore. And, um, and yet the online world is obviously just a blink in our history at the moment. Uh, and it challenges the way that we do those, the way that we have done those things traditionally. So transparency is more possible, therefore expected. That raises some interesting questions for us. Reporters are expected to, generally in the media, to build their own profiles and to be accountable directly for the way that they work and for the work that they do. That's obviously different for us or applies differently to us because we're a group of people who produce essentially one voice. Um, and there are also obviously many different forms of digital media, each with its own set of rules and expectations about uh, how people consume it and to what extent you can build trust in it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So for social media, um, I work on the social team, obviously, and we, we sort of generally talk about three rules when we are posting our articles um, on, on social. And they sort of uh, transpose some of the rules that we take from print, but specifically into the social world. Um, click again, please. So the first one is no emotion. Um, that's not sort of like a repressed British thing. It's... <laughs> It's, it's just that, um, you know, if, if we think that you should be mad about what uh, Maduro is doing in Venezuela, which we do, and we write about that quite stringently in our, in our copy, we're not going to deliberately use Facebook to, like, really, really tell you how to be mad. Um, we're going to be a bit more considerate and uh, a, a bit more thoughtful in how we do that. So we know that, you know, it, the algorithm favors emotion and that users favor emotion, uh, but we, we, we just choose to do things differently. And we choose to, in this case, uh, you know, we're saying, um, we're, it's, it's a, it sounds like a more neutral statement, but when you read the whole article, it is very, you know, very against him in this case. Uh, next one, no clickbait. So we don't want to lead you, we don't want to just want, you know, we don't just want you to click on a piece just because we want that two seconds amount of traffic that it's going to bring us. We, um, we think it's more trustworthy, uh, and we think it helps us to build trust if we uh, say, uh, if we kind of say what you're going to get when you click on this. So rather than in this case saying um, which country is, uh, you know, are the police becoming a military force, you know, we're going to tell you it's Brazil. Uh, next one, please. And also the, th the third one is uh, no riding. So what I mean by this is that um, a lot of... Uh, and we, we get asked this a lot on social media, both from colleagues, but more from outside, is like, to what extent do we on social media look at what's going on in terms of what the audience is talking about and feed that back to editorial decisions about what to commission and what stories to select? And um, almost as a rule, we don't do that. Uh, now, who knows whether that might change in a few years, but that's never been the way that we've done things. We, you know, we believe in sort of the sovereignty of, um, of editorial decision making. Um, I'm interested in if this comes up later and we can talk about it a bit more. Um, so, uh, you know, not a lot of people write about Hull. It's a town in the north of England, and not a lot of people write about it in the way uh, that this is written from. I'm actually from very near Hull, which is why I chose this example. Um, but it's the kind of thing that, like, you know, we have a Facebook audience of 8 million people. Most of them are not in Britain. Most of them have definitely not heard of Hull and don't know that you really pronounce it all. But we're going to share this anyway. We, we think this is an important story. We're going to do it anyway. Um, so those are sort of three rules that are re like relatively um, easy for us to apply. Um, and then also, if we have the next one, please. Uh, I just wanted to say that there are a few more, a few other ways that we are uh, sort of breaking some of our rules in terms of putting our journalists out there. We're doing Quora Q and A's with our journalists and editors, and um, where it's their face. There's actually one happening right now. Please don't tune in because listen to me. But there's one happening right now. Um, we do these live Quora Q and A's. They're good fun. It helps the readers engage with our writers. And then the next one, next slide, please. Um, and we also set up a Facebook group in the summer where we aim to discuss. Uh, American politics in a civil fashion. And believe it or not, it's working right now. 
It's, it's, it's happening. It's good. There's a lot of moderation going on. There's actually a member of, the, uh, of that Facebook group in this audience, in this room right now, and he just came up to me and said, I'm a member of the group, and that was such a thrill um, for me. So we're having this discussion um, in a Facebook group. We are you know, directly speaking to audiences there. And I think that's it from me. I'm going to pass over to Rabina, who's next. Let me just change this. Um. Uh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm Rubina Madan Philly, Philly, and I'm the director of audience engagement at The Intercept, um, which means that I handle quite a lot of different things. Um, in addition to uh, running social media and working on analytics um, and SEO, I also work on podcasts and newsletters and basically everything about The Intercept on all different platforms. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so The Intercept, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we're a nonprofit news organization that launched in 2014. Um, we were founded by a few pretty well-known journalists, um, including Glenn Greenwald, uh, Jeremy Scahill, and Laura Poitras, uh, following the NSA um, Snowden re revelations. And so um, we're really dedicated to exposing corruption and justice. Because we're a nonprofit, um, we have a lot more leeway than other journalism organizations do in the way that we cover stories. Um, we're really proud of not being beholden to corporate interests. And um, if you ever have the chance to work at a nonprofit news organization, I would highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's excellent. It's, an, it's like an oasis in journalism. Um, next slide, please. So we put out a... Um, a reader survey a while back um, to kind of gauge what the um, what other what people thought of us who were reading us, and um, we put it out to our newsletter list. And within 48 hours, we got 10,000 responses, which shocked us because we, you know, we were just building our newsletter list. And um, we asked them to describe in one word what they thought of the Intercept or how they would describe the Intercept. And what we were really proud of is um, that truth, trust reliable, those were the most frequently used words, that we had established this trusted relationship with our readers. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways that we were able to do this. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we um, really strive for is transparency. Um, we, take, uh, we take that really seriously. And um, if you go to our homepage and you look at our About Us, one thing that we have very prominently displayed is our editorial policies, including our policies on anonymous sourcing and um, basically, basically how our editorial team makes decisions. Um, this is just the first paragraph of it, but there's a much longer kind of description of what our, what our philosophies are. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing that we, t we take into account a lot is just privacy and how important that is for our readers. Um, when we were founded, we really um, wanted to think about how can, we, um, how can we do good analytics without invading the privacy of everyone who's coming to our site. And so there are certain things that we don't do. We don't actually use Google Analytics. Um, we spent a number of months working with Parsley to create a custom um, dashboard that would protect the privacy of our readers as much as we possibly could. Um, we don't track things like geolocation. And um, whenever we do track something, we make that really clear. Uh, just last week, we launched a privacy philosophy in addition to our normal privacy policy, which is also prominently displayed. And we put out these. Um, these blog posts every time we do something like this. Um, when we launched Parsley, we put out a blog post about how we measure um, our audience and what it means for our readers. So just having some conversation back and forth with our readers about it. Um, we also have our editors respond to them in the comments um, when they have concerns about privacy or questions. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, another thing that, that we do is we really try to be consistent across platforms. And I recognize, as somebody who's worked in social for a long time, that every platform has, um, you know, there's different types of stories that work on different platforms. There's different storytelling techniques that work on different platforms. However, just being consistent and making sure that when you find the intercept on Instagram versus Tumblr versus Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter or our newsletter, that you get some level of knowing that this is the same organization, that somebody has put thought into this to make sure that it's not just like, you know, this weird personality shift. Um, we, because I oversee um, all of those different platforms, a lot of that copy runs through me. Um, 
And I, and I understand that like, as a small news organization, it's easier for us to do this. But this is something we think about a lot, is that we want to make sure that the official intercept presence that we have, our investigative journalism, our high journalistic standards and our ethical standards, are work across all of the different uh, places that we are available. Uh, next slide. So um, I, when your audience team is really in sync, um, it's, it's almost difficult to tell who has written which post. And this is an experience I had with my very good friend, Alana Zak, who I started working with at the Wall Street Journal. She's laughing right there. Say hi, Alana. <laughs> um, so she, she and I worked together at the Wall Street Journal um, before, b before I was at The Intercept. Um, and we would often have a difficult time when we were lining things up in social flow. I would be looking at a story and I would line up something verbatim that was the same tweet or the same Facebook post. And we are, we are still very much in sync, but at The Intercept as well, um, when people on my, uh, on my team who I, who I train um, line something up, it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish who has written what. And a lot of that has to do with establishing the voice of your team and spending a lot of time on training and just figuring out like who do we want to be? What are the types of things that are going to be really interesting to our audience? And just getting into this, this mindset as a team about what we want to prioritize on these platforms. So no matter how many people you have on that team, whether it's a global news organization or a tiny nonprofit, um, it's really important to kind of make sure that's clear across the company. Uh, next slide. Another thing we take uh, seriously about our consistency across platforms is to think about how we can build trust through um, audio and video. So for so this is an example that I show here is uh, this is kind of, this is something that seems kind of unbelievable that Lindsey Graham would admit to. Um, it's an exclusive that we had that said you know I thought everybody else knew what the hell we were talking about with this whole healthcare thing. Um, and a lot of folks tweeted back at us or posted on Facebook or let us know in the comments that they thought the story was satire. And so we responded to them and we said. Yeah, we, we realize that this seems like an Onion article, but it's not. So, um, so we posted again, we included a link to the audio with that. Um, and we use audio as much as we can, we use primary sources, like documents as much as we can within the stories to prove that what we're putting out there isn't fake news. Um, we have um, documentation to back it up. Um, we also do this with our videos. Uh, one example is that we did a SEAL Team 6, ex we had a SEAL Team 6 exclusive by, um, by one of our investigative reporters, and he went on camera and really explained the story for readers. And when you see a reporter who's worked on a story for years, I mean, this was really a long investigation, um, talking about his work and what's, why it's so relevant and putting that up in a Facebook video, it's a high quality video that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the opposite of some of the clickbaitish videos you see um, so sometimes on Facebook that shows you, you know, who the reporter is, like why the story is important and reinforces the trust rather than uh, diminishing it. Uh, next slide, please. So along that point, we take uh, propping up our journalist voices really seriously. We were founded um, by some relatively well-known journalists um, who have big personalities. And rather than trying to combat that, we have embraced it. Um, so I, I really think about not just The Intercept, the brand, because a lot of folks might not have heard of it, uh, but the individual journalists behind that brand. Uh, next slide. So well, one, the one thing we do to kind of make it easier for people to connect directly with journalists is we do have Twitter bylines. So rather than saying that a story came from, um, from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or, or another news organization, we attach um, Twitter bylines to every single story. So if you click on a tweet on an, any article, you will get the author's author's handle on there. And so when you tweet out a story, the author knows it shows up in their mentions. Um, but you can also interact with them directly uh, much more easily because they can. St the, if somebody else starts a conversation and is replying to them, they can join in that conversation. And, um, and we do the same thing on Facebook. We really encourage people to set up uh, public profiles on there. And we have author bylines for all of them. Uh, next, next slide. Another thing we do in our newsletter is we try to make sure that we're highlighting our editors, like the people who are actually editing the stories, because oftentimes you have no idea who's edited it. Uh, most people don't really even pay that much attention to bylines, but they certainly don't pay attention to the 
the editing capacity behind it. Um, so each week when we send out our, our newsletter that has the roundup of our best stories and, our, and, and, our, and a couple of editors' picks that include our feature stories, um, we have a different editor write it. And usually they're talking about their own work and giving a little bit of a behind the scenes perspective. And um, you get to know who the editor is because you have their photo, you have their, um, you have their title, you can click on them, you can get more information, you can contact them directly. Um, all, of our, all of our reporters and editors also have PGP keys attached to their um, profiles, so if you want to contact them securely, you can too. Uh, next slide. We've also used our podcast a lot in order to do this. Um, uh, Jeremy Scahill, who hosts our podcast, will routinely do interviews with uh, the reporters and editors behind the stories. And uh, we recently launched a Facebook group to make it even easier to connect to people on our podcast. Um, this Facebook group, um, we got you know 2,000 members in a, basically like a week. Um, and we were really surprised by the response. Um, and uh, what, what's, what's interesting about it is that when people joined, the question that we had to vet them was how long have you been listening to the podcast? And I would say probably about 90% of people responded since the first episode or some variation of that. So that's an incredibly engaged community. And um, Jeremy, Jeremy Scahill, the host, goes on the podcast and does Facebook Lives. Um, you know, he just like, films himself like working on production. Um, we also have all of our producers as, as moderators and administrators of the podcast. So they jump in on all the comment threads and talk about it. Um, so people really get to know each of the producers as individuals in addition to Intercept employees. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Kim. Uh, next slide, please. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kim Boat. I'm the community editor of Geopolitics at News Deeply. Um, and I'll also give you a short overview of what we have specialized in and how we approach community-centered journalism. Next slide, please. So at News Deeply, we build single-issue platforms combining journalistic reporting, expert analysis, and community insights. We currently have five Deeplys, as we call our platforms, each covering a very important, complex, and yet underreported issue of our time. We have three geopolitical platforms, Syria Deeply, which covers the war in Syria. Refugees Deeply covers the global migration crisis, and I work on those both platforms mainly. And Women and Girls approaches issues female populations face in developing countries. And then we also have two environmental platforms. Oceans Deeply covers ocean health, and Water Deeply, the water crisis in the American West. And we are also studying a whole range of new topic platforms to roll out in a month and years to come. Next slide, please. Our users are key stakeholders, many of whom are professionally engaged on a topic. We have identified five different user segments. Policymakers, the private sector, uh, the knowledge sector with academia and research, the so social sector with NGOs and philanthropies, as well as the engaged public. Their need for consistent, high-quality information and exchange of ideas and an ongoing discussion isn't met by general interest media outlets. So we set out to meet these needs on our platforms and we're providing a public square to, for them to meet. Next slide, please. Community and Insights represents about 50 to 70% of all the content we publish. And many of our users are experts themselves and that's why we encourage them to become contributors. We call this expert-generated content, or ECG. And ECG, we found, creates much more high-fidelity information. And our expert users all see a part of the story that we might actually not see. But we do have to make sure that we tag it appropriately. We're constantly testing different interactions to see which ones work best. Next slide. And these are some of the ways we do it. Uh, beyond the more traditional formats like op-eds, Q&As, and book excerpts, we came up with our own community formats. Um, for our expert views, for example, we identify a timely and crucial question in the topic domain, and then we ask a subset of our expert community for their insight and opinion. We also collect questions for future expert views from our community. And in our Expert to Watch series, we highlight some of the leading thinkers on a given subtopic, like, for example, on de-escalation zones on Syria deeply. 
We actually also, um, what Rubina mentioned, tag every writer and expert in every tweet also to engage with them on social media and Facebook if, if possible. Um, next slide, please. It's essential and very important for us to tell the stories of the people directly affected by the crisis we cover. For example, in our diary series on Syria Deeply, we publish personal essays from people on the ground in Syria about their day-to-day -day life. And in our Refugee Voices section on Refugees Deeply, we let refugees tell their own stories. So here are a few examples of um, these people, the diaries and the Refugee Voices. We interviewed Uganda's Refugee Woman of the Year, Bella. Um, Mara, a teenage girl from Syria's besieged cities who fled from Switzerland, fled to Switzerland, sorry, recounted her journey <laughs> to, uh, for us. Um, one of our editors met with Abu Zar, 11 from Afghanistan in a refugee camp in Belgrade, Serbia, and collected his voice, and actually also the audio, which we integrated into the article. And Mahmoud Mustafa is a Syrian doctor on the bottom right um, who wrote a diary entry for us about how his work changed since the beginning of the war. Um, these formats act often tie, take a lot of time planning, translating, and editing um, because these are not professional journalists um, <coughs> or even professional writers. Um, but they're really worth every minute we spend on them and our community highly appreciates these insights and personal stories that you hardly find in any general interest media outlets. Thank you. Sorry. And finally, we're also introducing more live programming, like our Deeply Talks. Um, these are monthly conference calls with some of our experts, contributors, and editors, in which we discuss juicy questions that haven't been covered anywhere else yet. We invite our community members to listen in, ask questions, and continue the discussion afterwards online. So far, we've completed two rounds of those, and the response has been very positive. We're gathering incredibly smart and interesting questions from our communities, and we also notice that there's basically no drop-off during the call, so really most people listen from the beginning to the end. And we love seeing when these calls really spark a conversation among our community and they continue it afterwards online or offline. And yeah, with that, I'm looking forward to discuss more with Rubina and Adam and your questions and ideas later. Put this one. Um, th thank you, Kim. That was, that was wonderful. Um, so we're going to have a quick fireside chat between the three of us uh, about our respective organizations and how we build trust. Um, I want to start off by asking the two of you, um, what's more important to your organization, um, a large community of followers or a highly engaged, loyal one? Um, so a large community of followers or a highly engaged and loyal one, it's, uh, well, we want to we want our cake and eat it. I think that's, uh, that's kind of <laughs> obvious, right? So um, The Economist has uh, 1.5 million subscribers at the moment. We um, have a big plan in place, which is, uh, has an editorial component and a marketing component to um, increase that number. And we have a significant amount of investment to increase that number. Um, so we do want a large audience. Um, and that's through subscriptions. And that's because subscriptions is our business model. Um, rather than advertising. Uh, and so that's so we, we do some things for to play that volume game, meaning so um, you know we have uh, 20 million Twitter followers and 8 million Facebook uh, Facebook fans. And so a lot of what we do is is, is, is just is volume and is reach to continue growing that. But at the same time, we know that there are lots of people who just want, um, who, who want to engage around our content. It's provocative. People want to talk about it with each other and they want to engage with us. So that's why we do some of the other things that we do, like the Facebook group, uh, Q&As and things like that, um, to, to have that as well. Because we know that they become, those people sort of become your loyal ambassadors for you as well. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a mixture of both of those things. That's what I would say. Yeah, I think um, for us it's pretty obvious. Uh, as I said, like we have these key stakeholders, so we we already cut it down to these few groups. 
of people. Um, and what we want to facilitate is an exchange of information and, and ideas. So um, I would say, though, that so the, the a large following isn't necessarily important for us, though it is important for us to reach all of these people and all of the user segments. And that is, that is kind of a little bit difficult to because how, how do you even know like how many policymakers are there who are working on Syria or who are working on like I don't know how how many researchers are there that work on ocean health um, but yeah that said um, we do think that in, in, in part of the engaged public what I uh, what I said was was like the fifth uh, user segment um, we see actually journalists being as part of this. And we see that we have a lot of journalists who don't necessarily have the time to cover the Syrian war all the time or the migration crisis or any of the other topics that we cover. Um, and they come to us and look for information. They come to us to look for experts they want to approach and ask them questions or they want to interview them. Um, and that's how we see we can have a bigger reach, actually, like our information and our expert voices and our community voices as well um, find their way into the world this way. Um, yeah, I guess I gotta yeah. take the question back to you, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> How uh, do you see it? I mean, I, I definitely value um, loyalty more than uh, sheer size. Um, I, I, I know that The Intercept in particular is, is, a, is a bit of a niche publication, and we were founded out of national security reporting, which isn't everyone's uh, wheelhouse, um, but we've ex since expanded to cover things like criminal justice, human rights, um, you know, race, race relations, politics, um, corruption. Um, it's becoming more and more relevant to a large group of people. And we recently made um, a number of new hires, uh, which will make us even more more relevant. Um, but it's, uh, but but we do think a lot about serving so, so serving the people who. Um, you know, st started with us from the beginning and then expanding out from there. But we never, we, we really spent a lot of time with our community interacting with the people who, um, who are, are our core, like, Intercept audience. Um, and part of the reason for that is because uh, we just recently launched a membership program. And, um, you know, similar to what you said about subscriptions, it is... Uh, it, it is really important if you're going to launch a membership program where you're going to be reader supported as opposed to adverti advertising supported or subscription supported that um, you think about like how loyal your base is going to be and um, and we've been really pleasantly surprised I mean that's what that, that's what I was talking about with the podcast is a lot of the folks who were signing up for the Facebook group were people who had been listening since the first episode and of course we're continuing to grow and continuing to acquire new people but it really means a lot to us to have this group of super fans who um, Really want to engage with with uh, with us, you know, as 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 individuals. I I'm really interested in picking up the points that you made earlier, Rabina, about voice, mm -hmm. uh, about um, or, or diversity of voices. You know, you have, in contrast to the Economist, you have uh, the bylines everywhere, all over the place. You're 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 you know assigning work everywhere, um, and I mean it's kind of that is what you would do, wouldn't it, if you create. A publication like you guys did in this era of online news um, and just in a, in a similar way that The Economist doesn't have bylines because in 1843 newspapers didn't tend to have bylines you know that was the convention of the time and so uh, but I'm really interested in like sort of challenging the this the 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 with the conventional or the like the um, yeah the assumed wisdom of today just for the sake of the discussion that um, that putting bylines everywhere is um, essential to building trust. Uh, because on the one hand, I can understand why that is, because you want your journalism to be accountable, you want your journalists to be accountable, and you want them to be contactable, um, it helps them to develop their profile, it helps them to get sources, etc. On the other hand, The Economist is, um, you know, in defiance of that, still rating very high in levels of trust in research, and it's, we have a very, very loyal brand following. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of funny, but we have like a shop, an online shop that sells people's socks with The Economist <laughs> branded on it, right? <laughs> they really love it. And so, you know, so I just want to challenge that conventional wisdom of like, is the only way to, do, to build trust in online communities they, these days to have like the profiles of the journalist everywhere all over it? Absolutely not. Um, and I think part of the reason that it would, that Adam and I were interested in doing this panel and interested in having this discussion is because 
there are very few publications that are more different from each other than The Economist and The Intercept. Uh, you know, it's like a, this very storied brand that doesn't have bylines versus a very personality-driven new media company. Um, and and so I, I and, and that's part of the reason that that I, I was just fascinated by it. Um, I, I mean, the, the place where I used to work, the Wall Street Journal, is also one of the most trusted brands in terms of media. If you look at surveys, um, it usually comes out number one in terms of trust, um, partially because it kind of straddles both sides, um, liberal and conservative, uh, but it's, or more just like centrist right, I guess is what what, the, <laughs> what they're describing it in the we keynote. We use liberal in a different way, <laughs> being a British publication. That's, yeah, but um, I don't think The Economist was included in that, but I'm, I'm sure it, it would factor very highly in terms of trust as well. Um, it, it's absolutely not necessary to have a completely personality-driven brand. Um, you can take either approach. Um, the Economist has more of a voice of God. Like you mentioned, you know, you don't use emotion, and we don't, we don't follow that rule at The Intercept either. Um, we are absolutely happy for our readers to be outraged as long as we're presenting a story in an ethical uh, way and accurately representing it. It's okay if we're angry. I mean, this is a time to be angry. Um, and we don't, um, you know, we don't purport to, to be completely unbiased in our coverage either. If, if anything, our, our bias is, to, is kind of against the powerful to hold them accountable. Um, but it's, uh, but yeah, you don't have to have a personality-driven news organization. You could either do the voice of God approach um, with your news organization, and that works really well for major organizations that are built on scale, especially, or you could do the, the personality-driven approach, um, which just makes it really clear who the journalists are behind the story, but embraces their differences. And how does... Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to tag on to this. Um, so how you said how you're propping up your journalist voices, we are propping up our expert voices, right? I mean, partially also our contributors and journalists, but definitely our experts. Um, and that also is something that I guess in traditional journalism, journalism is almost like kind of a taboo because you, you don't you don't want to look at have it look like it's just like kind of the, the comms department wrote this op-ed and we are publishing this. Um, but we actually see that in the crisis we cover, uh, there are experts on the ground who might actually not want to write anything at all, and we have to really like go out there and pull them out there and have them write something and help them write something, right? Like we like really got them to the process, and um, and they have so much to say. Like they just have like and it's it. You wouldn't necessarily see this. You wouldn't necessarily read it. You wouldn't necessarily actually know about it. So, um, so yeah, therefore, like, we, we actually have this, this approach of something that might, in, in the very beginning, sound a little bit like, oh, like, what, like, kind of a little iffy. And um, it actually also leads to more, because we, 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 have to make, we have to make the point that we have to clearly label this as an expert opinion, or, like, clearly label, like, who wrote this and how this came about. Um, but then actually I think it really like leads to a more fruitful conversation, a more fruitful discussion. That's great. So I'm, I'm wondering in terms of accountability and building trust, what are, I mean, the, we, we, we spend a lot of time at ONA talking about accountability and engaging with your audience. Um, what are some ways to have readers hold your journalists accountable? Um, so, I guess if journalists are approachable, if they are open, and by the way, although we don't have bylines, we do on our website have a directory of our journalists and they are free to tweet and we encourage them to tweet about their own stories. So many of them do have a profile on social media. So I think approach them in that way. But I think that there's a, um, there's a, there's a slightly broader um, set of, I guess, indicators, trust indicators um, that's being developed at the um, at Santa Clara University with a bunch of media partners, and The Economist is one of those media partners. Um, the project is called The Trust Project, and uh, they're developing a whole bunch of these indicators, which include things like information about the author of the piece embedded, like, you know, kind of in a as a, as a protocol embedded in, in the story. So trying to improve the standards and standardize actually um, what information a media organization puts out about a piece, and in this case, the author. Um, and so I think that having those um, visible, I, I, aside from what I said about having no bylines in The Economist, I think that I think being approachable, I think is, is a really, really good thing. Um, similarly, I think being, um, open about, at the level of the organization, uh, about 
how you go about doing things like fact checking, what is, you know, publishing that policy, uh, publishing your fact checking policy, publishing your ethics policy, publishing your corporate structure. Uh, I just think being open about all of those things is just increasingly important and we can do that now because it's the internet. I also wanted to mention um, comments as, an, as, as a way of being accountable. Um, last year when I was here at, at the Online News Association conference, I saw the Corals Project speak and that was one of the, one of the things I really took away from this conference was I went back and I said, we need to completely change how we're doing comments um, because they can be a way of, of they're, they're really one of the only ways right now of holding journalists accountable within the actual, um, store, like within the actual story, in a way that's super accessible. Like you, you have the distributed platforms of Facebook and Twitter and you know all of the different social networks, but comments live with the article. And it's also a way of harnessing um, your reader interaction and encouraging them to give feedback on your site as opposed to through third parties. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about keeping comments um, you keep keeping comments while a lot of other news organizations are shutting them down. And just to jump in on that, mm -hmm. if, if, if we see a comment, it usually happens on Facebook that mm -hmm. says, oh, you got this wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, not quibbling with our opinions. People can do that. That's fine. We enjoy that. But if we've, you know, if we've got something factually wrong in the Facebook post, then um, making that correction and then adding that in the comment to say, we changed, we changed X to Y, sorry. Yeah, we, we absolutely do that as well, and we encourage our reporters to, um, to respond in the comments as well. Yeah, so what we do is um, we, I mean, we have like the, the luxury of having, I, I, I would say in this case, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a luxury um, that we have smaller communities, so we actually interact with them a lot um, via email, and we really don't get tired to reach out to them and say like, if you have any ideas, feedback, questions, um, please get in touch, and that's actually a big part of my job as a community editor. I feel like in, in many larger um, news organizations, it's oftentimes um, a lot social, and I mean, we do that too, but um, our expert communities are very active um, in emails, and it, it really creates a really nice direct exchange, and um, we gather a lot of ideas from our community that way, so we could really ask them and be like, what is the question that you really want to have answered? And what, what do you really want to talk about? What, what should we cover next? Um, these kind of things. Um, so yeah, and obviously, definitely, like whenever there is something wrong, we have to be make it very, very clear that there is a correction. And we clearly point out what we changed. Um, I think that's very crucial to establishing trust. We want to hear from you guys. There's a microphone right in the middle of the room. Please make your way there. You have to talk into the microphone because it's being recorded, etc. Um, yeah, please. Just, uh, I'm Michael Scholar with Louisville Public Media. Just to follow up on, on this last thread, one of the wonderful things about the internet is that we can ask people for feedback. One of the hardest things is that when people actually give us feedback, we're not set up to be able to process it. And so I'm curious as to how your organizations set that up. There's kind of one end of the spectrum, which is everyone's on their own. You know, send them to your Twitter feed or whatever and expect your folks to do it. I'd love to hear, if you have that model, what you explicitly expect of your folks in terms of response and monitoring. The other end of it, and I'm curious with your last comment, Kim, about doing things via email. Um, all of our email boxes are swamped. How do you set it up to make sure the worst thing in community engagement, as I think we all know, is when people actually, we call them to engage and then they go into a black hole and they don't hear anything, they don't get thanked. Mm -hmm. And for a smaller organization, the logistics of being able to manage a flow, the more successful you are with engagement, the more work you create for yourselves, the more people engage, the more they hear from you. So I'm just looking for advice on processes for a small organization or even, well, your organizations, how you kind of manage an increasing flow in a way so no, nothing gets dropped and material actually gets into the editorial process. Yeah, should I just, uh, so I, that, that's definitely one thing that I see. Um, it's, it's easier for us because our communities are smaller. I will say we have a lot of sheets. We work a lot with Google Sheets all the time and that's where we, collect, uh, where we can uh, collect all of our information. And um, we also experimented actually with uh, soliciting questions and, and answers too from our community um, through Google Forms. Um, so that makes it even easier to just like get it in that way. Um, 
Yeah, I think um, that it, what, what you're saying, I do get that um, it, it's, it's not enough to just say we want to get feedback and we want to collect, we want to get our community involved and then it just doesn't lead anywhere. I think it's very, very important that internally you have some sort of a process set up how you want to go about it and you probably need one person who leads that um, and takes care of it and then will like channel these questions to whoever needs to answer them or takes care of answering them. Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's how we do it. How about you guys? Yeah, one, one rule I try to follow is to close, close the loop. So if you're asking readers for some sort of engagement, you have to follow up with them in some way to let them know what happened afterwards. Like you can't just kind of throw something out into the ether, get responses and then drop it. Um, the, the other thing is to get buy-in from individual people across different departments and try to figure out, you know, who is going to be responsible for responding to these types of issues. So for example, when we launched our membership program, we were routinely getting, you know, you know, maybe just a lot of emails every day uh, with questions or feedback, and um, we established like a list that we could send that to a membership list so that they could respond to those people directly and really have close relationships with them. And of course, like sign you know with your title and and have it be personalized. Um, but just creating creating a workflow that that says like these people are responsible for these types of responses, and also really using Slack a lot because we have Slack channels for everything, including things like updates and corrections where we'll drop in if a, if a reporter um, mentions something, or if, if, a, if, if, we're, if we're holding our journalists accountable and somebody mentions something in a story that's not quite right, we'll drop it in there and, um, and we'll expect people to respond. I wouldn't add anything more. I think we should move on because we've mm -hmm. got quite a few questions now. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jay Rosen from New York University and I'm working with the correspondent on their uh, expansion to the US. I have a comment for Adam and a question for Rubina. Um, Adam, you said that um, the, the Economist uh, takes a somewhat aloof attitude towards um, lots of things that become popular online and doesn't want to respond to everything uh, because you believe in editorial sovereignty, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. I think that works is obviously working well for you guys. For me, the problem becomes when in moments of strain where you have to tell something to your readers that maybe they don't want to hear. And we will only hear things that we don't want to hear from people who understand us. And I think that's the risk of being somewhat aloof, is that in times of stress, you don't have that intimacy that you might have, even though being aloof also has huge advantages because it means that you're not jumping on every controversy of the day and that actually can build trust. So if you want to react to that, that's cool. Here's my question for Rabina. My reaction uh, is I agree that yeah. that's the risk. That's the risk, yeah. <laughs> so Rabina, has there been, and can you talk about a moment when The Intercept published something that enraged its loyal readers or made lots of people mad, and what did you do using the tools that you talked about in your presentation to handle that? Um, so we recently hired um, Sean King as a columnist, um, who many of you many of you are familiar with. A lot more people are familiar with Sean King than are familiar with The Intercept. It's, it's part of our personality-driven um, news organization method. And a lot of folks are pretty, I mean, they're, they're not particularly happy about us hiring him because he is, he's a very different sort of a journalist um, than we have typically hired. And, to, and, and, and to be honest, the, the feedback that we've gotten, um, the, it's, it's one of the rare cases when we haven't really been responding as much to people because there's not really anything we can say. Because it's, it's, their complaints are about things like race baiting, and the race baiting is really just talking about race, which is something that we haven't done you know, as, as much coverage of before, beforehand. Um, so it's, it's kind of like one of those cases where I, I would be with, with Adam on it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but yeah, it's a, but other than that, um, it's, it's definitely unusual for us to, uh, to, to get feedback from people that, that actually enrages, that they're actually enraged by the kinds of um, things that we're publishing. Um, 
we, we found generally that when we expand our, our coverage, uh, we, f we find that we keep our loyal readers and gain new ones. Um, it's really interesting, we did focus groups with both current and prospective readers. And what we found is that the, the prospective readers were really interested in what we were doing on other platforms. They were fascinated by our Instagram account. They said, you know, I'd really follow this, this group on, on Instagram. People had never heard of The Intercept, and they loved our videos, and they loved our, our photo essays. And the current readers were kind of looking at it and saying, I don't need them on Instagram. I don't need videos. Like, these videos are too basic for someone like me who already knows everything about security. And we're just, we just said, okay, great. We have you. But um, we also want to expand who we're reaching. And, and that's something that we try to emphasize a lot, is, is try to, we're going to keep those core people, most likely, but we're going to try to expand that group as well out. Hi, I'm Joy Mayer. I work on the Trusting News Project, which is all about empowering people, and journalists, day to day on like simple things we can be doing to earn trust. And I can't believe how often I hear from journalists that they don't think it's their problem. They think trust is a user end problem. Like, you know, it's their fault that they don't understand us. It's their fault that their media diet is crap. Um, so I wonder, maybe especially you, Adam, since you might work with journalists who are more traditional. Um, maybe set in their ways, I don't know, as, as opposed to newer organizations. I just wonder what you, if you find yourselves having to persuade any of your colleagues that trust is something we should be addressing in the newsroom, not just the marketing department day to day. Yes. Could you maybe say more about that? <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, uh, yes, so uh, we have a range of journalists in our newsroom, some of which um, have been with, with us for some time, some of which have you know, developed their skills as journalists in a different era to now. And we have some journalists who are you know, kind of you know, fresh eggs and they're developing their skills now. Um, and sometimes they're thinking about it in the way that of, of a traditional economist journalist, actually. And some of them are thinking about it in a m more modern, innovative way. So there are all sorts of different, you know, like we were hear hearing er earlier, there's, you know, there's no one such kind of person in Alabama, right? It's the same in the economist newsroom. Um, and so, um, but yes, I, um, I, I don't think I've ever heard from anybody that they don't see it as their responsibility to build trust. I mean, that is a huge alarm bell to me as a journalist <laughs> because it's like, well, you know, how do you expect to get good material from your sources if they don't trust you? Like, that's really, you know, that's really Maybe shocking. It's not their responsibility or they just don't think there's anything they can do about it. They've given up. Right, yeah. I guess I, the, 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 the thing that I do find myself talking about quite a lot is... Um, I sort of tr try to battle this perception that you know we can bash someone over the head with a copy of The Economist and tell them to trust us, and they will, because we've been around for 174 years. Um, you know, the, 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 there's a different game being played by an Economist print journalist who is you know focused on filing a story and getting the story out and saying something analytical and brainy, and me on my game, which is to continue growing the audience. And we say, you know. You, you might, you're thinking about the, the traditional economist reader. They already know who you are. Like Rubina was saying, you know, we got you. And I'm trying to find new people who don't know who we are. Uh, and so that's, that's a different game. So that's the way that I kind of talk about that issue with those guys is just to say, remember that there are, there are different games going on here and there are therefore different methods that, you know, about how we manage to do what we want to do. Does that help? Okay. Hello. I'd like to... Um here, if you guys can talk about a time or an incident where your um, readership's trust has been eroded and what you have done to rebuild it. I, so I have, a, I have a kind of recent example um, on Syria deeply. We had a piece and I mean Syria is this actually adds to the last question a little bit too. It's just a topic where you have so many different sides <laughs> involved and you have so many opinions um, or not, not a, no opinion at all. Um, but the people who are involved are like really, because they're, 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 they're part of it, right? So um, we're being very, very careful um, to show all sides of the conflict, which in the Syrian conflict really is a little bit hard sometimes, but um, 
we really try to not um, take one side and um, therefore also have contributors from um, different parts of the conflict, basically, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so we recently had one piece um, by a contributor um, who was seen as somewhat close to the Assad regime, or like her family was being seen as somewhat close to the Assad regime, um, which caused a huge uproar in, in, in our online community. Um, but the thing is, she is a very good writer and her piece was very well researched and it was just like people saw her name and they were like, just really angry about it. Um, so we then stepped in and kind of like talked to these people, you know, like just like, and let them know that they should actually also read the article. <laughs> That's also the thing is like, you cannot just complain just because you see the contributor's name. Um, and then uh, we continued working with this contributor and now we've seen like that actually the same people who were so outraged in the beginning uh, or in, in this, for this last piece, they actually now came around and um, picked it up and they really liked the other pieces of her and they, they, they endorsed these pieces. So, so yeah, that's that. That's how we did it in this case. Uh, hi, um, I have a simple. I mean, it's simple question um, coming from somebody who who comes here from Europe and sees media landscape a little bit different. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on like a thesis that people trust the media that confirms their biases instead of, you know, the media that is genuinely truthful. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely a fair, a fair assertion, and we've seen it play out. In, and, and certainly the platforms have made this problem much worse. Um, if you're on Facebook and it is feeding you exactly the types of stories that you want to see, then of course that's going to... The con confirmation bias is a very serious thing. Um, you will see, you know, if, if you put out a factual article um, about a topic, and um, you'll, you'll see people who just like deny that it's that it's true, and it has less to do. It, it has to do with, do with your brain's like rejection of what you what you don't know, and and they, they've had studies about that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing that we can do as a media as media organizations in order to combat that. What we need to do is provide more evidence of it. You know, it's it's like that's that's what I really think about in terms of primary sourcing. Like when people are rejecting something. Give them the audio, give them the original document, give them video, give them, um, you know, just like something that they can't refute. Um, that, really, that really helps a lot. I guess my answer is uh, to do with the, the approach that The Economist takes in the way that we cover things. As I said earlier, we're a views paper. You know, we, we apply a set of um, like British liberal values to everything and we do that transparently. You know, we, we say in our editorials this is the way that we think the world should be run, um, et cetera. And so, um, so we are biased in that sense completely, but we're transparent about it. Now, if someone wants to read us in order to um, you know, build their, their fact file so that they can then go to the pub and argue with someone from that point of view, then fine. But what we also know is that people read The Economist because we are their enemy, um, and that's cool too. Uh, and, and I guess... I would say that underpinning all of this and the thing that where we get into the realm, like the ethical realm of being journalists, I suppose, is that um, really we were founded to take part, and here's some language from 1843, to take part in a severe contest between an intelligence which presses forward and a timid ignorance obstructing our progress. And so the point there is about, um, it's, it's about looking at the world in a, in a rational way, using facts and figures, which we do all the time, uh, using critical thinking, etc. Now, when we do that, we happen to find ourselves at the British liberal end of the spectrum. Um, uh, but, but there's something more important than just where you end on that spectrum, and it's, and it's that point of critical thinking. So um, I guess, yeah, that would, that would be my answer, that that just imbues everything that we do and how we cover it. Um, have we got time for more? Let's, let's see. Them. Yeah? We'll I'm keep going until we get kicked out. Go on. Great. Michelle Ferrier, Ohio University, founder of Trollbusters. Um, my interest is in the difference in how you've approached your posture um, at The Economist as an anonymous 
and in others is a more personality-driven environment. And especially with the work that we do around online harassment, the personality-driven way of building trust through authentic voices, et cetera, can be very dangerous, um, especially online. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you do to protect your talent you're trading on the emotional labor that they're providing by exposing their personal selves um, in this way. So I'd like to understand a little bit about what you're doing to make sure that in that personality-driven way, you are also supporting the talent to be safe in doing their work. Thank you. Yeah, we, we definitely, I mean, if we, we've had some very controversial articles about Syria, for example, and um, we've found that, you know, the person who is, uh, who's written it will get a lot of kind of negative feedback about it. And we and, and I actually sit down and, and try to coach them through that. It's like, okay, like try to figure out what it is that you need to do to make this easier. You know, I can complain directly to the platforms, but but as as you know, like it's not always that easy to get something so something done for there. So it's like if you need to take a break, like stop looking at Twitter for 48 hours. Like, you know, shut down your notifications. Like you don't have like I, I really try to be mindful of them not feeling pressured to have to respond to people when they're just being attacked. And that's something I make very clear in the comments as well. You don't have to respond to the trolls. You respond to the people who are making really smart comments, whether they're critical or not, because you want to encourage more of those types of comments. And um, when I first started coaching reporters on responding to comments, they were just re they were responding to everything. And they're just like, this is terrible, because I'm just responding to trolls. And I was like, Stop doing that. Positive reinforcement really works. Like, respond to the comments you want to see more of, and you will see more positive comments. Yeah, I just have to add to that, um, that I think it also helps to have these different roles within a news organization, um, so that the reporter doesn't necessarily have to deal with this, or at least has like a coach like you. Um, and then, just another thing, I mean, like we, we for example, like when we work with people um, on the ground in Syria, which is, has become increasingly difficult, um, there is a point where we, like if the, the safety of the person is at risk, which c can happen, then we, we just, that, that's like first priority. That is, the, like, that, that, that is that's just it. Like there's no, no negotiating, nothing, and that's um, much worse than trolling. So um, then we, for example, just wouldn't, wouldn't use that clear name in order to, to save, their, save them and like, take care of their safety. That's, that's, the, that's the end, huh? Sure, well, um, thank you all very much. We'll take your question back here if you want to yeah. come talk to us. Um, but thank you all for, for making it. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we will tweet out the link to the resources. And please, you know, if you enjoyed this panel, please review it. Um, please mention your survey, just so, you know, so that Trevor knows as well.